Professor Shi Chun Fong, NUS Provost Professor Tan Ying Chai, NUSS President Mr. David Ho, ladies and gentlemen. A very good evening to everyone and a warm welcome to the NUSS public lecture today. My name is Eugene and I am delighted to take you through this evening's session. It is our honour to have Professor Shi Chun Fong with us today to share with us on Taking Singapore to the World, Growing Global Brands. To start the evening proper, may I now invite NUSS President Mr. David Ho to say a few words of his welcome address. Mr. Ho, please. Thank you, Eugene. I don't think I'm going to say a few words, but a little bit more words. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. NUSS honorary member and then US University Professor Xu Jun Fong, Provost Stanning Chai and US Senior Management staff, NUSS advisory member, I'm not sure if Mr. Wong Along is here yet, our past presidents, NUSS past presidents. NUSS Management Committee members, fellow NUSS members, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> NUSS organizes public lectures and professorship lectures as an academic engagement with our members. This evening, we are very proud to have our honorary member, Prof. Shi, to share with us his experiences, his visions, and how to bring Singapore to the world. I'm also very happy that I have the honor, doublest honor, to be a moderator. I'm not trained for that, but uh, I will moderate. So, so this evening, I have to say a few more words than normal. Let me first welcome Prof. Shi and uh, give you his background, although I think everybody knows Prof. Shi very, very well. Uh, but nonetheless, it's good to refresh our memories on his achievements in the recent past. <clears throat> Prof. Shi is a university professor of the National University of Singapore and holds advisory roles with Beijing University, University of China Academy of Science, CS Holdings, Legend Schools, South University of Science and Technology, China, University Technology Petronas, Saudi Aramco, among others. He was president of NUS from year 2000 to 2008, and subsequently the founding president of King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, CAS, a graduate research university in Saudi Arabia, until 2013. Prof. Shi is also a foreign member of the American Academy of Arts and Science and U.S. Academy of Engineering. He also serves on the judging panel of Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. He's awarded the French Declaration Chevalier in the Order of Legion d'Honneur in 2005. In 2007, he received the inaugural Chief Executive Leadership Award for Asia Pacific from the Council of Advancement and Support for Education. Drawing from various experiences at leading universities, Prof. Xi was instrumental in making NUS as a research in intensive university with an entrepreneurial dimension. I think that's the key word, entrepreneurial. As NUS president, he led the modernization of the undergraduate curriculum, implemented the modular course system, expanded overseas student exchange programs, and strengthened academic partnership with world-leading universities. He was a key driver for the formation of international alliance of research, of research universities and led 
the Association of Pacific Rim Universities for several years. In Beijing, Prof. Xi promoted the establishment of the Center for Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Technology Transfer, otherwise known as CIET2. CIET2 has been approved as a Center for Excellence with special funding from the Chinese Academy of Science. I think you'll elaborate further on this. Leading class in the form formative years, Prof. Xi promoted the university as a destination of choice for graduate education and cutting-edge research, where the synergy between education and research crystallizes the ideas and innovations to address global challenges and improve lives. Planned from inception with world-class research facilities and as a research park and innovation, innovation cluster, CAS is today a thriving work, play, leave community of several thousand faculty, as well as students, staff, and families from more than 100 countries. Prof. Xi now divides his time between China, Singapore, and US, where he is a distinguished, he's also a distinguished visiting professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Prof. Xi received his professional diploma in engineering from Singapore, an MS and PhD from Harvard University. He started his career in American science and engineering, an MIT spin-off and General Electric Corporation R&D in space and propulsion systems, respectfully, respectively. Please join me to welcome Prof. Xi to deliver this public lecture. Thank you. Good evening. I have to express my uh, gratitude for the opportunity to speak here. It's always a pleasure and privilege to be back at NUS and NUS Society. I had, my wife and I had many great years here and we, I continue to visit uh, NUS on a regular basis. And I still remember going a few years back. That I worked with David and all the uh, senior management here to develop this complex, uh, this wonderful complex here. And I can see it is, has been a very successful development. And tonight I'm really pleased to see so many of my friends here. What I want to do tonight is to share my experiences and some of my thoughts with you. And let's see. So it's about taking Singapore to the world and growing global brands. So let, let me say a few words. I will give you an sort of overview. What I want to talk about is two mega trends and opportunities. Because mega trends are both threats and opportunities. Because if you don't seize the opportunity and someone else take it, it becomes a threat to you. So trends, trends present both threats and opportunity. So that's what I'm going to talk about first. Now I'm going to talk about mega innovation wave, the first trend, the mega innovation wave. And I will show you what it did to Detroit and Silicon Valley. One, a little complacent, and the other move forward. The other trend I'm going to talk about is mega China, the great economic and social transformation of our time, perhaps even the greatest transformation of our time. And next, I'm going to talk about Singapore, taking the Lion City to the world by growing global brands. So this is the overview. Now let me take, why did I do this view? Well, I've always been an outlier, I've, you know, different. So I tell you what, I, my favorite when I was young is catching fish in the Long Kang. Now, I won't tell you which one of is me, but I was one of those guys there, you know, in the Long Kang trying to catch fish. <laughs> the other is, my favorite pastime at young is, I was captivated by Red Diffusion, master story, late I saw Li Da Sa, I don't know if you know him, and his stories of the Monkey King's exploits in Journey to the West. 
and they fired up my imagination, ignited my hope that I might one day live such an adventure. And so this is, this were my two favorite activities when I was young. So you can see I was not conventional. And so many of my views will also be not conventional. So what I do, I've journeyed west, east, middle east, east, and tonight I'm offering you some perspectives from an explorer. I like to think of myself as an explorer. So let me tell you a little bit where I've done. So my first thing is, at age 20, I went to the United States, or North America. And of course, from North America, it's a short hop to Europe. I did a lot. And I spent 30 years in North America, and much of the time also in Europe, because when you're a professor, you take sabbatical, you, you know, research collaboration. So spend all the time in the West. Then I journeyed home, back is. I came and I served as founding director of the Institute for Materials Research and Engineering. I joined NUS. I had a couple of responsibilities. I had a couple of responsibilities, but still one pay. <laughs> Several jobs for one pay. That's the Singapore system. <laughs> so I spent 12 years in Singapore. After 12 years in Singapore, I said that I could try something new. And what can be new than to go to the Middle East? So I spent two plus five. Let me explain you one, but two plus. I was two years as a consultant on advisory committee for the Minister of Petroleum and Minerals. That's probably the most important portfolio in the kingdom, besides, of course, being king. After the king is the Minister for Petroleum. And I was on his advisory committee for two years. And then, subsequently, I spent five years as the founding director of the King Abdullah University of Science Center. And it was actually an appointment made by King Abdullah himself. And after that, you know, I wanted to travel again. I said, really, my heritage, I'm proud of my heritage, is China. But I said, I'm Singaporean. Nevertheless, heritage from China. I got to spend time in China. So this is my third year in China. So tonight, we'll share experiences from my travels, my perspectives. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is journeys through cultures and careers. So, so to give it a little bit, I've spent 33 years in academia. I was professor, educator. I was deputy vice chancellor for three years and university president, 14 years. And I spent 15 years in industry. As I mentioned, I was in a spin-off. Long before it was popular, I was in a spin-off. I tell you, it's hard work. I've worked, I think, maybe 14 hours a day. I was at a spin off Then I went to corporate R&D GE, where I worked in the aerospace. So in both careers, I worked in the aerospace and jet propulsion. Then I became founding director of Imri. And so 15 years in the, in the industry. And then I've been always doing work as advisor consultant, which I continue to do when, when I was an academic. So let me share you share a few thoughts. What are the mega trends and mega opportunities? We're going to talk about mega trends and mega opportunities. The first is mega innovation wave. And this I do with the innovation and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial capitalism. And this is also you know, underpinned by talent, technology, and capital. So I'm talking about mega innovation wave, the first trend. The second trend is mega China. I spend time there, I'm going to talk about mega China, the great economic social transformation of our time. So let me move forward. As I said, trends present threats and opportunities. opportunities. So I'm going to talk about the ebbs and flows of wealth and power. But for tonight, I will talk more about wealth. I will stay away from the term power. So I will focus on wealth, the ebbs and flows of wealth. Of course, when wealth departs, power also departs, perhaps a little later. When wealth increases, power also comes, perhaps a little later. There's a lag, but it does come together. But for tonight, I'll speak of wealth, the ebbs and flows of wealth. So, 
In 203, now this is exactly quoted from, you know, Financial Times, not my words, it's an exact quote. Why Europe was the past, the US is the present, and the China dominated Asia, the future of the global economy. And we see a lot of things happening. Of course, when things move fast, there are bumpy rides, there are hiccups, but the overall trend is clear. China's economy is on the rise. I'll talk about that. So that's the ebbs and flow. Now, ebbs and flow, it's propelled by globalization. Of course, we talk globalization, talk of capital, trade, talent, and technology. But you know something? I'll tell you. So, so you see this picture here? Okay. So our ebbs and flow. Up to the 1900s, you see the richest country, Europe. Right? Then, 1950 onwards, America, America, now, coming 2010 onwards, you can see America, China, and perhaps in 20, 30 years, India will start rising. So the shift is clear. By the way, this came from the economists. So these are sources that I took on. You see, the flow. So, the absent flows of wealth is happening all the time. There is no constant. If anything, change is the only constant. It's always changing. So we got to be aware of what are some of these trends. And here's a trend. Okay, so let's go on. And I want to talk about one technology, particularly that facilitated the mega innovation wave. So I want to talk about a particular, what I call, uh, well, this like, work as well as I think it should, uh, about ubiquitous connectivity. What is connectivity? And why ubiquitous? Well, let me tell you what it is. And that's what we underrate is. First of all, it's about physical connection. Today, you hop on a plane, you buy a ticket, you can go almost anywhere in the world within 24 hours. Not so 50 years ago. Today, every part of the world is reachable. The airline cross continents, mountains, waters, whatever it crosses. So this is called physical connectivity. But more important, we have another one called, what is this? This is digital connectivity. And it's interactive. So together, this is what we call ubiquitous connectivity. So, Every one of us, each one of us, is connected to the other through connectivity, physically or digitally. It means that you have a great idea, it can spread at the speed of light. Innovations spread fast because we are all connected. We all know what's going on. Really, you can't really, you know, control the flow of information. All right, so the next one I want to talk about is what is this mega innovation wave? As I said, it's really facilitated, facilitated by physical, digital connectivity. So here's a report from the Economist. It's really about startup, the rise of micronationals, multinational. It's really about startup and the new global companies. It says, global companies are on the cusp of a third wave industrial revolution in which enterprising young innovators will play a central part. The rise of micro-nationals, multinational startups, which operate across high and low-cost locations, exemplifies opportunities wrought by globalization, digital communication, and the internet. This is what we're going to talk about. Now, I'll give you some examples of the mega-innovation wave driven by micro-multinationals and supported by entrepreneurial capitalism. A lot of venture capitalists with lots of money, and they want to bet. They want to place big bets also. So, all right. So, let's go forward. What are the breeding grounds of startups? I have the good fortune of being in the United States, so I know what it is. I was there for 30 years. I know what that meant. The next one is Europe. I spent some time there, not as much, but I also know. Guess what's next? China, and I did spend. I'm spending time there. China. So. I think, no doubt, 
America by far the leader, the talent magnet, and there are flows of talent technology all the time. So the US is an innovation startup capital of the world, and the founders are entrepreneurs from all continents. But there's a two-way flow. China is a recent one. I'll talk more about China. And China is fast-tracking innovation and entrepreneurship. And I, for my part, is involved in the setting up of the Center for Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Technology Transfer, CIET2, which I said is under the Chinese Academy of Sciences. By the way, that has an operating budget of somewhere between seven to eight billion US dollars a year. It's huge. It has more than 100 research facilities. Many of the moon projects were developed by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, including planes and all the other things. Fundamental science and, a, and, and big technology projects. So we are, I'm working there, doing some work with them. All right, next step. I want to talk about interactive ubiquitous information system. We thought, I said, this is really a very powerful technology. And if we're not careful, this is what's going to pull the rug under us. Uber. I know recently there's talk about Singapore. Should we allow Uber in? Should we keep our regular taxes? A lot of debate. But I tell you, we've got to be careful. Uber has turned the smartphone into a tool for dynamic pricing and allocating car rides in real time. And so traditional taxis have a problem. They're very successful in the US. They're also in China. I've used it. China also has its own Uber. There you are. That's China's version of Uber. It's also working. China catches up pretty fast. I don't know if you heard about Airbnb. That's another one. Dynamic pricing. Now, Airbnb started as, you know, for, you know, get a bed. B and B stands for air bed, you know, so that you can fold up. You, when the people come, you blow up the bed, then you become a bed. Bed and breakfast. It started as, you know, low-level stuff for people on a very meager budget. Do you know today? There are chateaus and castles all registered on Airbnb. If you want to stay in the chateau, you can look at it and you see how fast it grows? This is going to be big. I think the, the capitalizing agents will be in the tens of billions. And Uber is also in tens of billions. And all this is happening in a couple of years. That's the power of technology. And this is driven by what? Connectivity, digital connectivity, all powered by digital connectivity. And of course, airplane, you cannot travel without airplane. So you have digital and physical connectivity, and now the world is on the go. So, okay. Then I want to talk, that is a trend, which is also a threat. If you don't understand connectivity, if we can grapple with that, it becomes a threat. I want to talk about something else now. There are lots of other opportunities. So I want to talk about mega opportunities. You know, the world of huge growing markets. Just now, I had an interview with someone, and we were talking about growing startups. Well, the Singapore market is five million people. Think of the world's market. At this time, we have 7.2 billion people in the world. In 30 years or 35, it will be 9.6 billion. And you know what they want? 50% more food, 30% more water, 45% energy. That's a lot of opportunities for new companies, for startups, for allocation resources, green technology, all of this. Then, more opportunity, Trans-Pacific Partnership. You can see who's in it. Uh, it's United States and the uh, East Side Asia Pacific. That's one opportunity. Big markets, 40% of the world's economy. Then there's another one by China, One Belt, One Road. More opportunities. So my point is this. What I'm saying is mega trends presents opportunities, but they're also threats if you do not seize those opportunities. Because others will do it. And you're left out. Okay. So let's now talk about United States. I want to talk about a little time about United States because I spend a lot of time there. And I'll talk of, in particular, two cities. 
that were affected by innovation wave. So I call it tail two cities. The first is Detroit, the industrial powerhouse of America. It was, it transformed America in the first half of the 20th century. Big, but you will see, it got left behind. Why did it left behind? I will talk about it. Then Silicon Valley and Bay Area, the reigning startup capital of America, transforming America in the second half of the 20th century and continuing to transform America. So let's talk about this. So Detroit, in fact, was the automobile capital of the world. It created, more than anything else, the automobile created sprawling cities of America, the interstate highways, and transformed how Americans live, work, and play. I don't have heard the term, the American love affair with the automobile. That's where Detroit started, the love affair with the automobile. Many Americans own several cars. That started by Detroit. Then, so Detroit transformed America, see all of this? That's Detroit with the cars. Huge. Detroit was the fourth largest city in America in the 1950s. There is Detroit. Detroit was about opportunity. See? Mainly Detroit. Opportunity. Now, Detroit in the 50s, big houses, beautiful houses. Now let's look. But Detroit was left behind. So you see, it could not catch up. Because in a way, it belonged to an old economy, huge manufacturing. You know, the bigger you are, the more inertia. Difficult to move on, difficult to adapt to new technology, but difficult to see new innovations. Uh, innovations. This is Detroit today. I was there in the 60s. I was also there in the 90s. Big difference. You can't believe what it is. Detroit today. Detroit today, jobless, factories closed, car companies closed. Let's show you another one, Detroit today. Because you can buy houses for a dollar, but it comes with all its liabilities, because the liabilities are far larger than one dollar. But you can buy a home for a dollar. That's Detroit. Look at it. OK, so that's the sad story. Left behind by the mega innovation wave. Not able to innovate, not able to see the trends. Therefore, it succumbed. Silicon Valley, I want to talk about, and the Bay Area, the startup capital of America. That's Silicon Valley. You see, it's, you all know these companies, don't you? You just look at it. Many companies. The, it's the breeding ground, right? The breeding ground for high-tech startups, many that turn into billion-dollar companies. I'll show you a few more later. I'll elaborate on a few more. And you know, talk about Silicon Valley. See, it's a cartoon. It's not about hardware or physical facility. It's really a state of mind. It's a culture. So I tell you what it is. It's a culture. It's a state of mind. It's about people passionate about the big idea and engaging, meeting like-minded people who share that passion. Lots of it. It's a place where fermentation of ideas. So. What was Silicon Valley? This was Silicon Valley. Actually, I was there in the 60s, too. It was just farmland, really farmland. The only good thing there was Hewlett Packard was just beginning. That was it. That's farmland. But, in fact, it's called the Valley of Hearts. Like, that's where lovers and, you know, congregate, you know, romance. The rise of Silicon Valley. Now, four ingredients change Silicon Valley. I won't go into it. That's, I will call, self-entrepreneurs. I'll talk about entrepreneurs later on. Fermental ideas leading to big ideas. Network of like-minded like people. Now, of course, you need money. 
You can have ideas, you can entrepreneurs, you also need people willing to part with their money in order to make more money. So it's our people, all kinds of people with big dreams, taking big risks to create the next big thing. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is the personalities and visitors. Visitors. But once you're successful, everyone in part, why everyone wants to be there. So let me show you some personality. There you are. You saw them. And I'm going to talk about this person in particular because he's been very active in China. So I'll show you something about him. But see all these guys, I think you know them. Even, you know, the future king and queen of England is there, hobnobbing with the entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Okay. So of course, Silicon Valley has something. That's, of course, Stanford. Offers plenty of young, enterprising talents. As I said, it's really young with ideas. Who are the risk takers? Who really don't have much to lose? You know, except a few years, they try, and if they make it, if not, they still can take a regular job, you know? But they have five, ten years to spare. Okay, so plenty of young talents. Then, there is Berkeley. In fact, I would say even more young enterprising talents. In fact, Berkeley is a microcosm of East Asia. I've been to Berkeley and I want to take what comes from a distinguished professor from Berkeley. I'm so pleased that we recruited him uh, you know, to NUS. Berkeley, also plenty of young enterprising talents. Our provost is from the east side, from Yale. And Yale is also great universities. And Yale is also, in fact, now it's bringing more applied science into Yale now. Universities are moving into engineering and applied science because they realize the importance of innovation and entrepreneurship for economic growth. So Berkeley. And you know, this is, compare this with Detroit. Look at this. This is a picture of, you know, San Francisco Bay Area. And this is the entrepreneurial center. Innovation, center of innovation and technology. So let me, what can we learn from Silicon Valley? I want to say a few words about Silicon Valley because I had questions I read recently that we are, Singapore is bringing a lot of money into R&D. So I want to say a few words about research and the connection with new enterprises. So this is a conventional view. I'll elaborate. We have research, which goes to technology, and then you get a startup. Yes, that's one way to do it. But there's another way called the Silicon Valley way or experience. It's the entrepreneur with a big idea. I show a few. That creates a technology, and once there's some technology, he goes around recruiting all the top guys. Create a startup, then becomes, you know, a global brand. That's another way of doing it. And this is the one that I want to talk, speak a little bit about, the Silicon Valley way. So what can you learn from Silicon Valley? Of course, we know about Steve Jobs and Apple. Today, the largest uh, by market capitalization. I think the capital is almost equal to SGX, if you check the numbers. One company, almost equal to SGX. Microsoft, Google, Facebook. You know what's common over these guys? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, it's not very good news for academics because they were mostly college dropouts. So we, we might not be doing something right. Uh, why are these guys college dropouts? Every one of them. Including Larry, and they, they were graduate school. At least they went to undergraduate, but they dropped out from graduate school. So that's some commonality. I'm not saying that we should encourage our students to drop out. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that. But it's just a US phenomenon. So we don't have to follow US, I think. But I think we must be sure that we provide what I'm going to talk about opportunities for entrepreneurial activities on campus. That's what I'm talking about. And what's different is they're street savvy risk takers with lots of self-confidence. How do they develop the self-confidence? Because these are thinkers. They always had the opportunity, the space to explore and to experiment, to fail, to fail, to rise again, fail and rise, and that's what developed the self-confidence. They know their limits, they know what they can do, and that's what's so the opportunity to explore and experiment. A little more space for them. 
So I want to talk about now second verse of Star Canal. Well, why? The more why? Well, it's built by four forces: talent, technology, capital, and culture. We talk about talent and the technology, culture and capital. But culture is important. I talk about ecosystem because there is the culture risk taking of exploration, experimentation. I talk about that. Silicon Valley has an immigrant culture. By immigrant culture, I mean from all around the globe. Look, if you look at Silicon Valley, you ask how many of the entrepreneurs come from Silicon Valley? Maybe 5% or less. Where they come from? United States, China, India, all the world over. That's where they come from. So it is a magnet. Silicon Valley itself doesn't contribute that many countries. They come from all over the United States. But the United States itself is a continent. Now, Singapore is 5 million. That's what I'm saying. You put it in contrast. When you speak of the United States, don't compare Singapore to the United States. It is 350 million people. So it's two orders of magnitude larger. OK. So now I'll talk about something else. This is Detroit. This is Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. So these are two American cities, so let me summarize. One mile in the old economy is factories built the American dream. It was left behind. And there's a lesson, because I shared this lesson in China too. You may be doing well today, but if you're not innovating, you can be left behind. And here, the other one shaped the new economy. It's entrepreneurs built the startup capital of America. But you've got to watch the trend. So one was watchful, knows what's going on, and the other sort of got complacent. And see, this is what happened. OK, so now iPhone. I'm going to talk about iPhone. I like the iPhone because, you know, I was in China, and I talked. Do you know that iPhone, the net profit of an iPhone is somewhere around 30, I'm talking net, not gross, net profit for iPhone is 30%. And after paying its uh, engineers and uh, designers in Silicon Valley top pay, they still make 30% profit. So design in US, made in China. What is China's uh, take from this one? It's about 1% of whatever iPhone made. If they make 30%, China makes 1%. That's a lot, a big difference for all the factories and all the, you know, pollution and all you do with it. So the question, will it always be this way? I think the juries are, I think there's competition coming. China is starting its own iPhone business. And now I'm going to talk about China. So I spent US, now I'm going to talk about China. Why? Because the competition is on. So let's talk about China. This is China. See, it's a huge country. It's a continent. The U.S. is a continent. China also a continent, except it has 1.4 billion people. Now, that's three times the size of the United States in terms of population. Huge. So let's talk about China. So I call it mega China, not just for the continent itself. It's a continent, but for the number of people, the population. So the great economic and social transformation of our time, that's China. So I want to say more a few words. Oops, did I? Sorry, I, I, I might have. OK, so okay, so this is it, the great economic. So I want to talk, what is this economic? So it's a rising economic superpower. So let me tell you some things about China. China has the longest continuous history of any country in the world, 3,500 years of written history. It is the most populous country in the world. It has the world's second largest GDP and largest by PPP, purchasing power parity, the largest. China is enormous. I've been in China three years now. I've traveled many parts of China. It's diverse. It's rapidly changing. That's China, enormous. I thought US enormous. I'm going to China, even bigger. Huge, that's just everything. Let me show you what it is, and historical and deep culture. That's China. This is the world's largest engineering project. It was done thousands of years ago. You see? And let's talk about China's contribution to the world. 
over a millennium includes a compass, gunpowder, paper making, printing, porcelain, abacus, many other things. So this is a country that did great things in the past. Now, of course, the question asks, why were not these inventions commercialized? What stopped it? Well, there's a lot of story. But the China today is different. They are commercializing their inventions, their knowledge. Not before, but, but what I'm saying is there is deep intellectual capability in China. The question is to take that capability into commercial products and services. And China's mindset is changing. I'll tell you, I'll show you examples. And China is becoming a hotbed of innovation. It's changing. So they have deep technical capability. Now they can turn that into commercial success. Okay, so China has mega projects. Mega China, mega projects. I have seen some of them. I, I can tell the scale is huge. I've listed here, each of them are in tens of billions. Wind farm, 17 billion. Global Center, Beijing. By the way, I don't know if you know, in terms of green technology, China produce more green technology and, 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 and install more wind power and solar power than the rest of the world combined. So we always think China's backward, China's polluting. No, it's polluting because it has a huge population of 1.4 billion people. But it's also innovating. It is the world's leader in green technology. It has in, installed more wind power, solar power than the rest of the world combined. So it has the world's largest high-speed system. So let me tell you what, what it is. China consumes twice as much steel as US, Europe, Japan combined. See how big it is. Uh, China by China, will build 10 New York-sized cities. I'll give you an example later on. One example. 10 New York-sized in 10 years. Huge. And by the way, China's going to build in the next 10 years more than 100 nuclear, gigawatt-power nuclear reactors. Huge construction in partnership with the French, because I'm also, you know, aware of all these things. Huge development. Now, the most powerful hydroelectric dam in the world, Three Gorges. It's so powerful. I don't. Can, can you read it? It slowed the Earth's rotation down by 0 0.6 microseconds. Now, if some of you know engineering, you know what to call rotational inertia. You know, let me take one 10 seconds to explain why it slowed down. Have you seen people do ballet dance, uh, they call, uh, not ballet dance, what do you call those, uh, ice skating? And when they bring their hands down, they spin faster. Because, okay, so the world's like that. You have a globe. You have a constant, constant rotational momentum. If you make the globe, if you protrude something more, then the rotational inertia is higher. Then it's low. So even the constant mass, the rotation is not because you build such an elevated. Because when you elevate billions of tons of water by a few hundred feet, the earth rotation slowed down, and they can measure that. Of course, it will not affect us, but the earth rotation has slowed. <laughs> so you see the importance of China. Okay, so a little bit of engineering here called rotational inertia. Now, China built mega project. In fact, we live in Beijing. My, my wife and I live in Beijing. China is going to build 130 million megapolis around Beijing. So let me play you the tape. China plans super city of 130 million people around Beijing. The Chinese government is embarking on an ambitious project to make Beijing the center of a super metropolis that would house 130 million people. The megalopolis would be spread over 82,000 square miles, about six times the size of New York City, but with a population larger than a third of the United States. The new plan will link Beijing to Hebei province and the economic area around Tianjin, with China's capital moving part of its bureaucracy, factories and hospitals to the hinterland. A subway and better light rail system are planned to open in the next three to five years and a new bridge across the Chaobai River to Beijing is under construction. With this new supercity, Beijing will become the focus for culture and technology, 
TNT in the research base for manufacturing, with Hervey more likely to focus on minor industries such as textiles. The plan is aimed at revamping northern China's economy by offering services that are now lacking in hinterlands, such as bus terminals, schools, cinemas, and parks. The entire project also implies a reconsideration of how taxes are collected and distributed, which will include instituting property taxes and allowing local governments to keep them. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about China. So you get one little sense of China. OK, so the first thing is China is the world's largest trading nation. And that's why when China slowed down and bought less commodities, you recall the 2008 crisis. Actually, the developing world did all right. It was just the developed world that went into trouble. The developing world went all right, because you know why? China was still sucking all the commodities, so everybody was merrily producing. But now that China economy is slow by half a percent, that's all, half a percent, everybody's crying. Australia, Africa, Latin America, all the commodities, oil price went down, everything is down to show how big, even though the economy is only 65 percent, two thirds of the United States, in terms of its power to attract commodities and oil. It is the biggest consumer of commodities, or of minerals and oil. So that's why when China slow, even by half a percent, things get rough. So it's the world's largest trading nation. So I, that's the Boha economic room I showed you there. That's about 150 million people. The next one is Yangtze economic zone, so big. So China can talk economic zones, each on all the 150 million people. Then there is the Pearl River Delta. So three economic zones. I just want to be sure what's going on in China. It's huge. Then the next thing I'll talk about is Beijing. What is in Beijing? It's the SNT and cultural capital. You heard it just now. Beijing. Then I'm going to talk about Shanghai. What is Shanghai? Well, Shanghai is like the New York City. It is really the fashion, the financial center of China, okay? The, fa the financial and fashion lifestyle capital. It's a swinging city. That's Shanghai. The next one is Pearl River Delta. And there we have the South China Sea. And I will show you a little more. Uh, I will show you a little more about Shenzhen, how Shenzhen started. That's Deng Xiaoping, the Southern Tour, 1992. I'll talk a little bit about Shenzhen. You see, it's all like Huawei, you know, Tencent. You know, those of you who do uh, WeChat and all of that. You see, all the big companies, the startup capital, the manufacturing, the startup and manufacturing capital, China. So what was Shenzhen in the 70s? This was Shenzhen in the 70s. Mud flats. That's it. Let's see what's Shenzhen today. I went to Shenzhen many times. This shot was taken. Let me show you what it is. A year or two ago, they finished airport. Look at this airport. Futuristic. Huge, humongous. And Baoan Airport. Look at this. Cavernous. That's Shenzhen. That's Shenzhen. And Okay, if you look at it, guess where Shenzhen? This part is Shenzhen. That part is Hong Kong. Shenzhen is developing so fast. It's growing out itself. Oh no. And the property price in Shenzhen is very high. But something will surprise you. There's more to Shenzhen than simply development. It's about technical talent and salary. By the way, if you look at technical talent in Shenzhen, if you're a top engineer, your pay is about 10 or 20% below US counterpart. The Shenzhen salary for engineers and researchers are higher than China, I mean higher than Hong Kong. So now, you remember old days Shenzhen, people used to live in Shenzhen and work in Hong Kong? Flipped. Now they live in Hong Kong and work in Shenzhen to get a higher pay. In a matter of 30 years. So things can change. All I'm saying is 
You should not be complacent. My story, don't be complacent. Things can change. The salary of certain engineers are far higher than Hong Kong now. So it's catching up. I'm talking about the top. Of course, at the bottom end, it's still low. But the top is high because they are recruiting the very best from Europe and the United States. And they've got to pay them world-class salaries. So that's Sunshine. So it's not just a lot of construction. Great paying jobs. Oops. Oh, did I miss something just now? I, I... Uh, so, so yeah, I got this. OK. So now let's go to the next one. OK. So, this, is, this one is not China, this is really Shenzhen, okay? This, this line here is Shenzhen. I, I said China is wrong. This is Shenzhen, okay? All right. Now, I want to talk about, I said China is a hotspot of startups, entrepreneurship. So let me show you a picture. This is really taken. I've been to Inoue. I've been to several places. Inoue was a street. The government decided this would be the innovation street. Took over the whole street. It's about one half kilometer long, both sides, water property. The whole thing turned into innovation. Cafes and everything. All night going, 24 hours, nonstop. I was there. So I'll show you something. And it's called Inoue, Innovation Way. The entire street. So when China does something, it does it in a big way because you're near 1.4 billion people. There's so many streets. What's converting one street to innovation park, you know? Just convert the whole street. No traffic. In fact, they even have a health clinic. If you get too stressed out, you can go and visit them. <laughs> I even saw a health center. OK. So this is innovation. And uh, let's see what it is. Oh, there you are, in a way. OK. In the daytime. In fact, there are more people in the night than in the day. Because some people are doing two jobs. Daytime working, nighttime create their own companies. You know, burning the candles on both ends, as they say. OK, that, I was in Sunchun. There's a map I show. They're all trying to tie up with the United States. See ya? Uh, Sunchun, Beijing. I'm uh, sorry, I mean, uh, sorry, Beijing, San Francisco. That's the, that's the, I took a picture of that. OK? Then, oops. Oh, it's not working now. Then there's the coffee shop. I went there. See, this is the coffee shop, OK? 24-hour coffee shop, cheap coffee, you know? A cup of room and B. And that's the premier visiting Sunjin and talking. And that, of course, who else is that? Jack Ma. That's Jack Ma in Sunjin. Ah, uh, sorry, in uh, Beijing. All oh, is in Beijing, by the way, not Sunjin. This is, I'm talking about Beijing now, OK? That's where I spend most of my time, and I visit in Inoue. Inoue, yeah, OK? So, mass. Entrepreneurship and grassroots innovation. That's what China saw. Can you see the words? Mass entrepreneurship. It's not just entrepreneurship for the elites. Entrepreneurship is never for the elites. Entrepreneurship is for everyone. You, I gave you an example. You know, they may not be your best talents in the universities, but they might surprise you. So, grassroots innovation. All right, now we, we go next. Now, a few months ago, Mark Zuckerberg was in China. Guess what he did? I will show you this now. Is it working? Do I have to? This is entertaining. Ah, he says, change the world. Change the world a few months ago. That's my... Eh? Okay. I think we have to start again. We have to start again. We start again, OK? You have to hear the beginning. You have a sound? Oops. No, no. Oh, yeah, OK. So a dialogue with students. Not perfect Mandarin, but OK. Tinghua 
，今天我想要讨论改变世界的话题。有很多人会说你怎么啊啊，怎么创立企业，或者或啊怎么解决问题。所以我想要。讨论啊，讨论一个不一样的问题啊，不是怎么去创业，而是为什么创业？为什么创业啊？这就是使命的本质。所以今天我想要说三个故事。Okay, so I think in the interest of time, I'll stop. But I'll be happy to provide a reference for you. Okay, so you get a sense of it already. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so China is spending huge money in R and D. I want to move along, and that's what it is. And China's R and D in about five years or ten years will exceed U.S. and and will expand R and D. So China is building up R and D. That's a good development. Now, governments view R and D as key to innovation and economic growth. So let me tell you something about the Chinese Academy of Science. That's the one I'm affiliated with. This is the Chinese Academy of Sciences, CAS and UCAS, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and the University of Chinese Academy of Science. They have institutes all over China, more than 110 institutes. I think they have about I can't remember 30 or 40 thousand researchers, PhD researchers. Okay, that's. So my part was I went there. I persuaded Lisa. President Bai Junli, who's a minister level, to create this center. And now it's uh, given the status of center of excellence with funding from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So I like DNA because I want to talk about DNA. DNA is a double helix. You have two strands. If you want to grow DNA, you need two strands. Now I'll talk about the two strands. So I said, let's create the DNA. You need Two strands. Patterns all this is one strand. You know what's the missing strand? So I said, you need to create a program for enterprising talents. Engage them in experiential learning, entrepreneurship, internship, and stuff. In fact, some of you might be familiar. I'm sure, I'm sure Ng Chai would know. That's what we did at NUS. What do you call the overseas college? NUS, NOC, NUS overseas. So I'm just simply redoing overseas college, except much bigger scale, much bigger scale. So, and I said, you must provide support for high potential that integrate research-inspired and market-oriented innovation. So that is the way forward. So let me show you a little more. You know the Chinese like to play Tai Chi. Tai Chi is just a group sport. You learn from another. And it's not competitive. It's a really good sport. I say, yes, it's true. And really, innovation has aspects of teamwork. You, the coach, you coach entrepreneurs through group practice. You build, build community, passion for ideas, you talk. And you infuse community with entrepreneurial mindset, skills, and so forth. And I'm going to move forward. Basically, it's like Tai Chi. You learn with one another. But there's another part about. And I think in terms of group behavior, Singapore is pretty good. But there's one part that's missing. And also in China. Now, where that is that? You see. I love this picture. I was in Saudi Arabia. You know a falcon is the fastest animal in the world. It can fly, zoom down, and catch its prize. High up, several thousand feet, meters in the air, catch its prize, fly at 300 kilometers per hour. So fast, that's a falcon. It always catches prize. That's how fast. So I say, entrepreneur gonna move fast. You gotta be like a falcon. You can be a group. But you got to be strong, like a falcon. So I say, fortune favors the preparement. How do you prepare them to falcons? You know, is we got to build launch pads. We got to prepare young entrepreneurs through learning by doing. First of all, they catch small prize, and later on, they'll have to catch the big prize. But they got to be fast, and they got to be resilient, and they got to be strong. And then for startups to take off, fly high, and fast to catch the big prize, because everything is time sensitive. And so it's a seeing innovation DNA. It's a double strand. I'll come to it soon. 
So I said, China looks as young to drive its innovation. And to do that, we need to create the DNA of innovation, which is two strands. One strand is research and innovation. The other what? Entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship. OK. So let me come down now to why we are here tonight. So this is Singapore, the beautiful city. We call our home the Lion City. And let's see the Lion City. A few days ago, President Dr. Tony Tan said, how do we ensure our island nation remains a shining red dot so that our children and grandchildren will thrive? That's what the President said. So I thought about it. This is, I think, a week or 10 days ago. I thought about it. So I said, I was preparing my speech as well. Maybe the way, look at this. This was what it was 50 years ago, Singapore. Now, this is a close-up shot, a close-up shot of the harbor. Look at this, what's Singapore today. So I say, and Dr. Tan say, Singapore's prosperity must continue. But how? And the answer is to take the land city to the world by growing global brands. So let me suggest, I think this was in October, I wrote an article that says, turning local companies into global leaders. It was a little bit chicken tongue. I call it Singapore 2.0. It's like rebooting, so you get a new software, I say 2.0, you know, so chicken tongue, I say 2.0. But it's about turning local companies into global leaders. And I made the case for it. I made some arguments. But this evening, I want to propose a couple of mechanisms to make it happen. So this is it. The last 10, 15 minutes, I'll talk about that. OK. So what is, let's take stock of Singapore grow. We have grown very well. The point is, you know, we're going to have volatility coming in the years. And I think we all hear about it. So no need to talk about that. But we spend a lot of money R&D, but there's volatility, economic volatility. Rough weather is coming. So Singapore's continuing growth depends on innovation. I think everybody agrees. But let me tell you what innovation is not. Research papers, inventions, IP are bright ideas, but are not innovations. Innovations transform bright ideas into commercial products and services. You've got to transform bright ideas, whether it's papers, inventions, and so forth, into products and services. So this is a cartoon. That's what innovation is. Okay, it's not simply here. You go all the way to the market. Okay, so let me go. Pipeline. Now, this is what we usually think of the pipeline from research, R&D, to economic delivery, or basic discovery, technology, economic delivery. And that's a linear pipeline. And then below that, we have technology platforms, constant pipeline. You know, this part is not so easy. Entrepreneurs doesn't come up very much. You always think, this goes through. Now, remember I showed Silicon Valley? The entrepreneurs really make things happen. But you see, not much. There's always a linear path. OK, so R&D to commercialization. So I want to say innovation and commercialization, very different from research, from R&D. Very different. So I said this, right? This is the problem. And you know what? What's this problem about? See, R&D investments bring little economic returns. The question is why? Why do we bring economic returns? In fact, if you're a business, you'd be out of business. If you run R&D like this, you're out of business a long time ago. So what do, do we have to do? So objective of R&D is commercialization. What you really want is the other way, right? In research. And then you have multiplier, you get more money from commercial income, jobs. And what for that is the innovation ecosystem. And actually in many countries, with the exception of a few, the innovation ecosystem is the weakling. So I want to talk about the innovation DNA. As I said, DNA has two strands. So there's an R&D strand. The other strand is entrepreneurship. So 
If you want the DNA to duplicate, to reproduce, you need two strands. Much, many of us, many countries spend lots of money on R&D, invention, IP, and so forth. They got whole machineries, universities, research institutes, everyone doing this. But this is the weak link. This is the other strand. If you want to have innovation DNA, you got to support this strand. And that's what I say, and that person is the entrepreneur, marketer. Someone told me it's marketeer, it's okay. It's the, you need entrepreneur, but you also need someone who understands marketing, where the market is, what the consumer wants. It's really entrepreneur, marketer. Okay, so, and that is the essential piece. And I think this is the weak piece in many countries, China included. So, advancing integration ecosystem. Here you are. How do we do it? First of all, I have to say, innovation entrepreneurship should have a central place in the life and mission of our institutions. A central place in the life and mission of our institutions. It's not attending a few classes, you know, doing some projects. It really has to have a central place in the life and mission of institutions. Okay, advancing innovation now to grow global entrepreneurs and brands. Okay, so if we want to do this, first we must change the risk-averse mindset. And the mindset of institution and people will be our biggest challenge. You know, I, I like this card. Someone gave it to me. Here's this young boy, 18-month-old, and he's really told his whole life, the next 20 years, is prescribed for him or her. And I said, children are different. Some just need a longer leash to explore and experiment, to grow and develop. And some, from day one, I know some five years old children say, I want to be a rocket scientist, I want to be a physicist, I want to be a doctor. But some don't. They need just that room to explore, to experiment, to grow and develop. So we got to loosen up a little bit if you want to have an innovative economy. So I say, we should foster a culture of exploration, experimentation. Students can learn by doing. And it's okay to try new things and even sometimes fail. That's important. Failing is part of being innovative. And it's failing that gives you the self-confidence <coughs> to know your limits and to try. So I say our school should be less focused on KPIs, more on encouraging students to discover their talent and passion. <clears throat> so, so entrepreneurship is a contact spot that needs passion and skills to succeed. You can see that's what it is. You get bruised, but you have to recover. And competition is not only for winning but learning to be a first-rate player, to stay the game, because there will be failures coming along your way, and you've got to be resilient, and you've got to be a first-rate player. Okay, so I said that there are trends coming. All right, what do we do? Innovation, if you want to do innovation entrepreneurship, you must always be on the lookout. Look out for big events. Look out for trends. So. You've got to look east. Guess where is east? East. Change our mental map. That's east, United States. West, well, I think it's going to be China or Asia. That's the way it is, right? Look east, look west. You want to innovate? You want to be an entrepreneur? You've got to look at both sides. I think sometimes we're betting too much on one continent. We've got to place our bets on both continents. So I say, Two mega trends. So what did I talk about? So let me come up to the ending, the last five minutes. Two mega trends. First, I spoke of the mega innovation wave, driven by entrepreneurial capitalism. Young people, big ideas, supported by venture capitalists. The, what I call the ubiquitous connectivity, where great ideas spread at the speed of light. An example, Silicon Valley. The other is mega China, big trend. Threats and opportunities. So I remember Lee Kuan Yew said this. Our late Lee Kuan Yew, founding prime minister, he talked about his view on mega China. And that's why I said, I'm with you. Singaporeans need 
three capabilities to do business in China. Fluency in the Chinese language, knowledge of China's traditional culture, and an understanding of the ongoing changes in the social, economic, and political conditions of China. He said this. Okay, so catching the two mega trends. So I talked to mega, the mega innovation wave and mega China. So I like to paraphrase a great architect who redeveloped Chicago 150 years ago. And he said, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir our passion. And the other thing he said, remember that our sons and grandsons are going to do things that stagger us. By the way, he's a little incorrect. He was 150 years ago, so he did not think of women. But today, women work, so it should be, should be sons and daughters. So I think he will st stand corrected. So the sons and daughters, uh, we're going to be staggered by what they do. But first, we must create the environment, the ground, the breeding ground for them to succeed. So how do you catch two mega trends? So my, my thing is, how do you catch the mega trends? First, I think we need to create an innovation ecosystem. Change the mindset of young and unleash their entrepreneurial energy. You remember the little cartoon show with a little boy? We don't want to let that happen. That's not going to be good for entrepreneurship. Then, so I have two proposed play on the word mega, since he said make no little plan. So cheek of tongue, I said, let's make some mega initiatives. Global innovation wave. Uh, I'm sorry, global innovation launch pad and Innovation Enterprise College. So a little quick. Now, a few weeks ago, PM uh, <clears throat> Nishi Anung said, not a bad thing for Singaporeans to be in demand abroad, but they can come, pick up some ideas and come home to serve the country. So I took advantage of that and say, okay, we're gonna create a global innovation launch pads called GILS for breathing. You can breathe underwater too. Global innovation launch pads. And what is it? It is, to create an entrepreneurial footprint, we can have about 1,000 entrepreneurs spread over 10 launch pads in startup hotspots around the world, worldwide. And this will have incubators, accelerators, co-working spaces to seed ideas and support entrepreneurs and startups. And these launch pads will nurture and grow Singapore's global brands in the years to come. Okay, that's the idea, the global innovation launch pad. So, that's one mechanism. Now, so we can think of this, the Singapore, see, we spread all over the world, taking around the world, and they come back and forth, and you can see they're thriving, dynamic, and we become the nerve center. In fact, I think Singapore Business Foundation said that Singapore is the nerve center of the global innovation launch pads. Look at the young with all this entrepreneurs, energy. So the other thing is we need to create, I urge the creation of the Innovation Enterprise College. And what will it do? The mission to engender innovativeness, entrepreneurship, catch the mega China wave, and room of a thousand with two years at NUS, two years in China, we can find a Chinese partner, and the mission to college will be non-conventional. So this is really building up NOC. NUS has a very successful NOC. We just create a bigger scale. And on the average, send a thousand students back and forth to China, Singapore, and all over the world. That's to know China. Okay. Now about anchoring the young. There's always a concern that if a young goes abroad, green pasture, they might not return. Well, oh, so can we knock off this one? This, I cannot remove it, right? I oh, never mind. I, 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 because this, this, this is not on. Never mind. The mouse is not on. No, I think it's okay. I read up for you. It's really about growing up. Singapore must be a positive experience. Growing up in Singapore, that's not this. Okay. Our ratio of young should not be based on expediency, but on shared values and aspiration. And the young must see a bright future for themselves and their families in Singapore. And this will anchor them for a lifetime. This will be the Singapore heart. So we need them to be, have a global mind, 
with Singapore hearts. So that's what I say, the young will take the Lion City to the world and grow Singapore's global brands. And global minds, the Singapore hearts, will ensure Singapore's continuing prosperity. I think there's no better way to remember Singapore's founding father and founding prime minister. I want to see what did he say. He said, it is the people's innovativeness, entrepreneurship, teamwork, and their work ethic that gives them that sharp, keen, keen edge in competitiveness. And the quality of people determines the outcome of a nation. And the best investment, taking on what the late Lee Kuan Yew said, is to invest in the young people. So I thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Let me just do a quick uh, uh, house rules. If you are a member of NUSS, please state your name and your membership. And uh, if you are not of the same st stature as Prof. Shi, your question, your, what you're going to say should be a question and not a, you know, a speech because you, <laughs> we don't want to hear speeches uh, from the floor. So let's start. Is there anyone burning to ask some questions? Yes? Can you all please queue up uh, if you have a lot of questions? Hello, yeah. Prof. Shi. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from uh, US two years ago. I'm the uh, USS member. Uh, my English name is Ted. So uh, I will ask this one in Chinese, then I will repeat the question. Is that okay? Okay. Because now the government has proposed the one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-
Detroit, floundered. But people can move to other parts of the United States. If the economy, I'm not saying Singapore was stagnant, if Singapore economy begins to slow down, what do we do about property price? What to do with young people in the jobs? There is not much place you can move around within a five million population. So I think when you're small, it does not mean you do not want to take a hard look at innovation. I think you do more. That's why I said we got to see the world as an opportunity. We got to take our young all over the world, let them, you know, seize opportunities around. Even PM Li Xian Long said, not a bad idea for a young to go overseas and pursue opportunities. The hope is they will come back and bring back some good ideas and bring back technology. So I, I'm on a different field. I, I think the small part of Singapore does not, should not inhibit us from creating an innovation ecosystem. Next, uh, sorry. I'm Can Wang Hui from the uh, research office of AUS. I have a question about Shenzhen, uh, uh, which is uh, also related to the last part of your talk. Uh, Shenzhen is the <coughs> uh, city produced uh, many uh, top Chinese universities, uh, Chinese uh, companies like Huawei, also high tech, now mm. is a, a global company. Uh, but uh, its universities are not the top ones in research, uh, such as Shenzhen University. This is uh, quite different from, say, Silicon Valley, uh, where uh, there are Stanford and UC Berkeley. Uh, does that mean uh, the research and the entrepreneurship or uh, the ecosystem uh, for startup are quite different? Uh, uh, in nature or uh, require different uh, skills of a people? Thank you. That's a very good question. You know, unlike Silicon Valley, Shenzhen does not have the great universities of Stanford and Berkeley. It's, Shenzhen University is fine. In fact, I, I visit Shenzhen University. I visit uh, South University of Science and Technology in China. I visit a number of universities in Shenzhen. So Shenzhen will start at somewhat of the lower end of the innovation curve. But there's still great technologies coming out because, as I mentioned, think of the Jack Ma and all of the other great entrepreneurs. They did not graduate from universities, but they have great ideas, they have passion, and they have a big dream. Well, what they did is to go around recruiting the very best to be part of the team. So Shenzhen might not have great universities, but they can recruit graduates from Shanghai, Beijing, and so forth. But you're right, there's still a disadvantage. I think over time, Shenzhen will, over time, build its research university. It will take time, it will take 20, 30, maybe 40 years. But over time, it will do. But what is happening with Shenzhen is, it's a very open economy. It allows very smart people from North, central China, elsewhere of the world, to go to Shenzhen, they have a very open economy. So you're right. It's the kind of uh, ecosystem they have is different from Silicon Valley. But there is also a place for them. So there's a place for Silicon Valley, there's a place for Shenzhen. And there will also be a place for Singapore. We just have to know where is the space we're going to play. We do not want to play in the same space as Silicon Valley or somebody else. We must find the own space we, that we play, the kind of technology we want to, to, to build, and where to put our startups. But I think, yes, there are opportunities, and we just have to think hard and see where the opportunities lie and what space, what technology space that we want to play. Next question, Manu, please. Yeah, yeah. Francis, yeah. Manu's give yes, us his uh, Prof Shi, my name is Manu. Um, I am a graduate from this university even though I tried hard to drop out. <laughs> um, my question is, you know, the interesting, the comparison between China and the US and the efforts they are putting in to reinvent their economies and nurture new companies and businesses. But uh, could you comment on, uh, given the very different uh, political systems and therefore a different style in terms of rule of law and other things. 
uh, which of uh, the two you know has the advantage or disadvantage in that sense longer term because um, you know uh, when you get innovative people they they also want a lot of freedom in other areas as well I think yeah, it's a very good question I've been China now three years and even before that I visited <laughs> I've been visiting China regularly. I think one should not say the US culture, the US system is the only way for, or is the best way for innovation. I think each country will develop their own the ecosystem in their own way, you know, with their own culture, their own values, heritage, and so forth. I mean, entrepreneurship is doing well in Shenzhen, Shanghai, and Beijing. I've been there. I mean, these guys are working 24 hours around the clock. I've been there. I've seen them working. And to say they are less driven, less hungry than American counterparts, it's not true. I've been to Silicon Valley. I've seen how hard they work. The same thing is in China. So it happens on both sides. So I don't think we should stereotype and say, if you can be like America, have a very untidy system, you know, you will not be able to innovate. I think that's not true. I think each country will develop its own. So I think Singapore will also develop its own. But having said that, I would say that China is really reducing its regulations when it comes to startups and so forth. In China, there's a place that you can create a registered company within an hour. I've seen it happen. All one stop, register kind of create a startup. I've seen Chinese startups, you know, or desk about the size of this panel here with an address. You register the address for and you have a company and that little table costs you hundred RMB a month, which is what, twenty dollars a month. You have a space and a common space. You can be an entrepreneur, you have a company. So China will find its own way forward. You don't see that in Silicon Valley. The costs are much higher in Silicon Valley. So China has advantage of cost advantage. The cost advantage. I think it's I think it would be incorrect to say that the US is the US system is the way forward. Okay, okay. If I may ask one more question, I mean just just to say that I, I think you're on Singapore, you know, you, you said that yeah, yeah, you've put up very good ideas, but I, I think the company formation in Singapore actually has been quite high, and there are uh, various agencies promoting entrepreneurship and innovation, but perhaps uh, one, of, one, one factor is that, you know, in, in the US, in Silicon Valley, you know, there are very big investors uh, who, have, who have already been successful previously, and they are pouring money into new uh, companies, new ideas, so the financial power, the amount they are throwing in is much more than here, although we have money as well. And I think in, uh, we, we hear of the success stories like Netflix and Google and, and, and so on, Airbnb, but there are also many failures, of course, in the process. So in, in Singapore, on the other hand, um, perhaps the depth of financing and the sophistication of the financing is not that great. So you find that the entrepreneurs are able to achieve financing to a certain point, but to sometimes to grow the company and to persist and resolve the problems and finally achieve success and financial uh, pro uh, profits and so on, you know, it takes, takes quite a long while. So uh, the, the ideas uh, may not have that much backing to take it to that stage, you know, where they become viable, they become uh, self, cash flow is positive and they can be profitable and they can then grow. And of course, the small market is... Uh, the small local market is also a disadvantage because in, in the US you can, you know, if you start a subway or something, you straight away you can multiply across many, many uh, places. So could you comment on that? I mean, I think the uh, small market is a problem. Yeah. And also uh, getting funding. Yes. But I think government recently is putting more funds, I understand Spring and so forth, are putting more funds yeah. for startups. But I think the limited market is certainly a problem because ultimately it's able to scale your business because I said about connectivity if you don't scale your business someone will come and eat your lunch you know like Uber right. uh, Airbnb all these things are happy they have an advantage to scale 
and technology. Because connectivity is all. So you say, I just want Singapore market, not viable in the long run. Because ultimately, if that market is important, some of big will come in. Mm. So that's why I said that we have entrepreneurs, they start here, they must think big. They got to think global. We got to go global. And that's the only way, and that really is the way to forward. Because as long as you restrict your operation to Singapore, I think over time, I think you'll be, uh, you'll be challenged. And, and others, the foreign companies, the foreign you know, giants will, you know, will move in. Thank you. Yeah, Francis. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I like your idea about this link between research and commercialization, and that link is innovation. And I think the government recognizes that because, as, I mean, NUS, it is NOC and all that stuff, is to develop this kind of innovation. But I think there's a huge problem in Singapore. Because if you look at Singapore in the last 50 years, what has brought our success? Our success has been brought up by getting the best students from A-levels, sending them to the best universities, Oxford, Cambridge, etc., bringing them back here, put them in the civil service, run the civil service in a very safe way, and then when they retire, put them in the GLCs. So that's the model of our success so far. And we haven't got out of that mode, because that mode, that kind of training, never brings up the entrepreneurial spirit. It's the safe way to do things. I know I'm going to get this job. I, the red carpet is laid out for me when I come back, maybe even become a politician, etc. So how do you break out of this mold? Because the next 50 years, the, the model of success that has brought up to today, which is wonderful, all that metropolis and all that, will never bring us for the next 50 years. And it's so hard to tear ourselves away from the way that we've been doing, which has been a very successful model. How do you break away from that success model, which will actually be the failure for the next 50 years? And you know, the, what I find very frustrating is that we get our best students, and we send them overseas. Why aren't our best students studying in our own universities and developing our own place, rather than go there, come back, you know, run the civil service, and we continue this mode? How do you change that? Prof. Sri, I just want to add. <laughs> no, no, I just want to add that the best brains, best students may not be entrepreneurial, so we send them out. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, uh, the point I'm saying is that's a place for quality civil servants. There is a place for them. But I think you're right, we should not put all our talents into, say, civil service or something else. We should spread our talents to other areas. And by having said that, as you see what I've said, many of the top entrepreneurs, the great entrepreneurs, they were not academically inclined to begin with. Singapore's greatest Success story, Sim Mong Hu, where did he come from? Holy technique. So I think we may be barking up the wrong tree if you say, you insist the nine A's or whatever A's, that they should be the entrepreneurs. It might surprise you that the polys or ITEs could create, create or produce your next generation entrepreneurs. What I'm saying is we've got to get the opportunity, but the important thing is to have, to give young people the opportunity to explore and to experiment, to know their talent, to find their passion. And actually, when there is a confluence of talent and passion, the young man or young woman will do well. And it happened that that has talent and passion, you know, is in the area of entrepreneurship, much better for us. So I don't think it's such a simple case of black and white that we lose out because many of scholars go straight into administration. Maybe you should widen the pool, look at the polys and look at maybe, so I'll tell you a story about America. I look at the B students, you know, in, in, in Howard is a very famous saying. It says that, I once asked a student, an undergrad, because I was a tutor, uh, uh, teaching fellow, you are taking it rather easy. 
He said, oh, I'm very happy with C grades. He said, why? He said, my job here is to find out who are the A students. <laughs> because I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And when I become an entrepreneur, I'm going to hire all oh, these A students to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you a story. And you look at America, the great entrepreneurs, they were not the, you know, summa cum laude or whatever, they dropped out. Then they hired the smartest people on this planet, and they all work for Bill Gates and all these guys and Zuckerberg and so forth. Barely a bachelor's degree. So I don't think, I think we should open our mind and not say that academic excellence means someone who's also create great prosperity for Singapore. They may be able to manage our system, regulate the system, create a fair playing ground. In other words, you know, they manage the country. But the ones that create prosperity, prosperity, the ones who create wealth, that could be a different group of people. But uh, as a follow-on question, just yeah, okay. which, uh, because uh, if you're thinking, okay, we've been doing this NOC for 10 years already, and there's no indictment by NUS or anything, of the 10 years that we have, have we really produced anybody who has made a name, a, a global company, who's thinking about, there was Razor, but Sim Wong Wu was not. So what have, my, the, which is a following question, because I think there is a huge uphill battle because parents don't want their children to be on premise. Uh, the system somehow doesn't, you know, despite the fact that we're trying to do a lot, but somehow the mindset of Singaporeans is not. And unless you can change that mindset, rather than take the safe way, become the civil servant, become the politician, earn millions of bucks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and change people's mind, it's, it's not as easy as we think it is, that the mindset has not been changed, despite what the government is trying to do, despite what NUS is trying to do, the mindset has, hasn't been changed. That's why all these things has not made much of a difference up, up to now, anyway. Thank you. First of all, let me say thank you. I have to say there are moderate successes of uh, uh, alumni from NOC. I met them in China, I met a few of them. They're doing relatively well. Yes, they have not reached the standing of Mark Zuckerberg and so forth. But you know, how many Mark Zuckerberg Bill Gates in the world? <laughs> America draws from 350 million people. But we do have some moderate success. And I believe in time to come, we will also have great entrepreneurs the world will recognize. You know, we've got to be patient. So you, as you know, if you have 100 entrepreneurs, maybe 5% will succeed. But I tell those who don't succeed, don't, even if you do not succeed, you have learned something invaluable. And you can go to company and even go towards senior manager. Say, I would rather hire an entrepreneur who has failed several times in my, if I had a company, than simply someone coming out of, you know, administration or business school. Because that entrepreneur, I know, he, she will know how to grapple with real problems. So, even if you, in the end, did not succeed in creating your own company, you have learned so much. You have learned to be a fighter. You have self-confidence. You have ideas. That person will be an asset to a company, to, or any company. Thank you. Yes. Good evening, Prof. Shi. My name is Stefan. I'm a member of NUSS. So I'd like to echo Francis' question in terms of um, culture and um, the mindset of Singaporeans over here. Now, the thing is, um, it's not just about Singaporeans per se or parents per se, but what about the industry? How do you see this um, the difference between um, Singapore innovation ecosystem culture versus that of US? Because um, I understand one of the key challenges in Singapore is a lot of these young entrepreneurs, they find that it's difficult to get a support ecosystem in terms of part, maybe um, getting a foothold in the local market because established companies they are resistant to these new changes, these incumbents. How do you see the diffusion of culture um, into the industries to some of these older mature players who act like Detroit? Thank you. You know, incumbents, of course, when you get a certain size, generally there's a preference to continue doing what you've been good at. I mean, that's natural, and that's why, you know, entrepreneurs usually, you know, start their own companies. 
But part of innovation could also be process innovation. Now it's an existing company could still innovate and create better value for their product. Not necessarily by starting a new company, but doing what we call process innovation. There's a lot of process innovation. And I, I think, as I said, I, I've been away for a long time. I've been away for 50 years, and I come back and forth, and so for the last two, you know, I was here for some years. But I really don't know the local scene well. But to be fair, when your market is 5 million people, you had big risk if you try to innovate because to do even process innovation takes huge sums of money. And if you're only selling to 5 million people, you know, you say, what is the upside versus the downside? So there might not be enough upside to justify the, 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 the cost, the risk of doing process innovation for existing companies. And that's why I said, but if you look worldwide, then you say, if I want to capture a global market, we, then that can be the factor in, in, in whether to put money to innovation. But I would say it's something. The trends are clear. These are innovation, is a mega, there's a mega innovation wave, and there's mega China. If we simply sit on an island and say, I'm very happy to do business in Singapore and not really find out what's going on in the world, I think there will be uh, serious challenges. I think our people have to look out and look at this mega trends and see how we can catch these mega trends and benefit from these mega trends. I think Singapore government is doing that. I think there's some partnership with China for a third uh, uh, area of partnership. So they're doing something. But I'm, what I'm saying is we have to do more to go out and find more opportunities for our companies, for our young people. Thank you. Sorry, great. Hi, good evening. My name is Terence. Um, I graduated from NUS in 2006. I started working while I was in NUS in order to pay for my tuition fees, in order to pay for my hostel fees. So I was kind of like an entrepreneur, right? I got started. And then now today I run my own financial services firm and I'm also part of the NUSS mentorship program where I mentor the young undergraduates. So I'd like to offer some perspective and maybe a suggestion and maybe hear your point of view on it rather than a direct question. Is it the duty of the university to nurture entrepreneurs or is it the, the duty of the university to try to nurture enterprising people, which is your point in, from the previous question? Because if we look at the DNA of an entrepreneur, um, I would like to mention two specific traits. Number one, there's a hunger, there's a need to break out of their comfort zone or rather there is no comfort zone because they, they are working on survival. And number two, they identify a problem to solve and then they go about creating a product or service to solve that problem for a big enough um, captive market, right? As you correctly pointed out, we have five million, right? If our people look at five million and think of solving the problems of 5 million, that's only so far our businesses can go. But if you look at ASEAN, for example, which has the same number of population as Europe, right, then perhaps the opportunity is there. However, however, given the nature of our students today, they all grew up in a very comfortable environment. Do they actually know the societal problems, the challenges that our neighbours are facing? And be able to come up with the solutions and the ideas and the products and the services to bring it to market. So, for NUS, we have a lot of very hungry ASEAN and Asian students with us, right? And these are people who are going to network here, learn, get the intellectual capital, go back and build businesses highly likely, right? So, perhaps, instead of thinking of us as um, the Nerf Centre. In fact, we should work with our ASEAN neighbours and get our students to go there and, and, and work from the companies. And then perhaps even if we cannot build entrepreneurs at the end of the day, like what you mentioned previously, we are able to build enterprising people who can solve problems, who can run companies. Yeah, so that's my observation and 
That's my feedback. I think it's a fair observation. I think what NOC does is we create opportunities for enterprising talents to work for internship, you know, to do internship to, and to, to, to what we call uh, experiential education. And it's up to them to decide, do I want to pursue this path or do I do something else? So it's creating opportunity. But OG does not mean that they will become entrepreneur. But I hope that the students that are going to N NOC will become more enterprising. That's what we want. And some of the enterprising talents will then say, I want to be an entrepreneur. And it's a hard life ahead. Okay? So, so that's what we are saying. Now, by working in ASEAN, I think that's natural. I think we should always think beyond Singapore. I think students should not, or young people should not say, well, going to ASEAN is hardship. I think it's opportunity. You know, I, I suggest going to China to create the, say, Singapore-China Innovation Enterprise College because we really got to understand China. We got to network with Chinese. We got to know what makes the, the companies tick. If you're to create a company there, companies in China, startups in China, you got to know a lot more about China Sim than simply saying, I read about China from my books. You know? so, so same thing, if you want to do companies in ASEAN, you got to know the economy, you got to know the people there. So I think we just have to be, look, some of the young people have to look beyond Singapore's shores. I think, let me just try to bring back the focus what Prof Xi is trying to uh, deliver. One mega trends, I think uh, we're looking at, there are a lot of markets in ASEAN as well, but I think China is where the emergence of uh, huge market and opportunities. How Singaporeans can be enterprising and entrepreneurial to, take, to exploit that opportunity. I'm not saying that there are no opportunities. I mean, there is India, you know, but China is where the mega trend is all about. I mean, the, 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 you look at the statistics and all. So perhaps we should put our mindset to encourage our young people to be more entrepreneurial and take advantage of that trend. I mean, that's an observation. Sorry, you go ahead. Yeah, my name is Jack Tan. Uh, I'm an NUS member. So I'm very fortunate to be uh, associated with China for many years. And I'm going to China almost every month to look at the business there. Now, I have one observation here. Now, a few months ago, my friend sent a message over the WhatsApp and asking for engineers, any engineers want to work in Shenzhen. What is the job? The job is to transfer a production line in Singapore to Shenzhen. Okay, so that means it's bringing the job there and train the people over there to be more competent, to be able to produce, right? If you look back to Singapore, maybe 20 years ago, a lot of MNC come to Singapore to recruit people to develop business in China. But today, they don't need Singaporean because they say that, well, I can recruit local people. They are more qualified, they understand Chinese culture, they understand one root, one belt. But today you look around in Singapore, nobody knows what is this one root, one belt. What opportunities are there? Okay, today's a job that for Singaporean, maybe it's like you, high level, <laughs> that they need those people, the brain. But it's quite difficult for the young people to have the space to be trained today. What is China? What are the opportunity? As what you say, you need to give them the space to explore, to experience, to fail a little bit more before they accumulate the experience to be able to identify the opportunity going forward. But they are deprived of all these opportunities. So how do we do it? So, you know, I've been in China in my third year. You'd be surprised. I meet you know, many of my American friends, similar age, or a little younger than me. You know what? Their sons and daughters are working in startups in China. These are Americans. 
Caucasians, they're learning Chinese language, learning Chinese culture. They see opportunities in China. They're working there in startups, creating their own companies. So I think it comes back to the mindset again. I think sometimes the problem of success is we get complacent. Singapore is so good, the living is so good, everything works. No winter, you know, no storms, no haze, you know, everything is fine, good food, yeah, food court, parents do your laundry, drive you around, whatever, I don't know what it is, you know. It's a pretty good life in Singapore. And so people say, well, I don't want to go to China and, and be an entrepreneur and take all that risk. So it's a difficult problem. But our future success, our future prosperity will depend on people, enterprising talents, who are able to grow global companies, take Singapore the world by growing global companies. Even China, let me tell you, I said my American friends and European friends, some of them even sending their children to to do college education in China. Some of them, young people in their 20s, I met them several times, I introduced them to companies, are doing startup working for low level jobs because they say, I'm looking for the opportunity. Meanwhile, I'm willing to endure hardships and low pay because I can see where the future lies. These are smart people. They know where the future is, what the, what the opportunities are. So, I think we, 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 we need to be open to this. So how, you know, I think one of the problems is we have to speak to our young people and show them the opportunity. I mean, this is going to be a tough one. The mindset is a tough one. I've met, you know, Americans who are so successful, they are a good number, they are very hungry. So how do we solve this? I, I don't know. But the other place also I should mention, most of my talk I focus on China. Because I've been to China many times. I spent many years here. India is also an opportunity, okay? But I did not discuss that. India is also an opportunity. But having said that, I agree, there are tough challenges. And by the way, you should know, China is moving out its manufacturing, low-end manufacturing, to countries like Vietnam, Africa, South America, and they're going high-end. As I showed you, the Chinese mantra is no longer made in China. The Chinese mantra now is created in China. That's what they want to go for. So Singapore, be very careful. If we want to do manufacturing, it should be high-end manufacturing. Because I'm not sure that, you know, what the future is for just, you know, commodity manufacturing. Let me come back and ask you this question. When you say that uh, we want uh, to do our young people with the entrepreneur's passion to go to China, and it's just not understanding Chinese, but understanding the culture, 3,500 years of culture. And you can only achieve this if you, the young are uh, mixed together you know, like students spending years there. And here we start to have an NUS, you know, NUS Yale University because we want a liberal arts university to understand how opening up the thinking. You think it is possible to convince our government to have a joint venture or partnership with uh, Beita or, you know, uh, Xinhua and with NUS? for that matter, and then bring students here, encourage our students to study in you know, four years so that there is a linkage, uh, a partnership for the next 50 years. Because when they become the next uh, president of China, we are already there, we know them. You know. <laughs> so what do you think? Oh, I, I like that idea. In fact, I, I did not want to suggest it. I said that we should build an innovation enterprise college and I would naturally think that NUS should take the lead, you know. NUS has many, has deep partnerships with Beida, you know, perhaps even with Tsinghua. So that would be, you know, a partnership like the Yale NUS partnership. It could be NUS, Beida, NUS, Tsinghua partnership. 
But I think now, because of the opportunities, our focus should be on innovation and entrepreneurship. But innovation and entrepreneurship doesn't happen in a vacuum. As you said, you can know the culture. So there will be lessons in literature, Chinese history, legal system, and so forth. But there should be a healthy dose of innovation and entrepreneurship. There should be experiential learning internships. So it's in some ways similar to, you know, the Yale NUS, we could have NUS, Beta, NUS, Qingong, whatever it is, but do more <coughs> while we provide the basic liberal arts or history, literature, culture, and so forth, we should have a healthy dose of you know, innovation, entrepreneurship, experiential learning. You know, I think that's a great thing. I mean, we can think of a college, a steady state of about 1,000, 2,000 students. You know, when I think of Singapore, if you look, you add up all the universities in Singapore, the five universities, five polys, right? There must be at least, what, 100,000, 200,000 students all, all in? I don't have the number. But certainly, well over 100,000 Singaporean students currently in a tertiary education. You include, you know, ITE, poly, universities, and then maybe another tens of thousands overseas. So what does it take? To, to build this college, 1,000, 2,000 students, total enrollment, specializing to create a partnership with China and laying the foundation for our enterprises to go global and make it big in China. I think this is such a powerful idea. So I like your idea. I think we can integrate the two ideas. Yeah, but Prof, you have all the connection and you have all the expertise. I think you can actually would it as true <laughs> if it has been, you know, as a good idea? Uh, I'd be happy to facilitate because I do know the presidents of Beta and Tsinghua, so I'd be happy to facilitate. But the will has to come from, you know, the leadership of NUS, the leadership of institutions. And the yes. government has to, of course, be willing to say, okay. We put in the money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we have, uh, sorry, the lady, yes, please. Good evening, uh, Prof. Shi, thank you for your presentation. I'm Joey Gan from the NUSS. So I actually volunteer at uh, Startup Singapore as a mentor and judge to some of the startups. And one of the things uh, that I notice is that uh, the students actually, much as they are very passionate coming up with innovative ideas, one of the aspects is the mentorship, availability of good uh, judges, mentors, that's willing to take the extra mark to guide them. So with regard to the two initiatives that you propose, so I'm thinking, you know, we have a wealth of uh, talent in the room actually, and the alumni, we have a strong pool of alumni, you know, with lots of experience, global experience, regional experience, a particular industry or skill set. So how can we, you know, master Singaporeans or even whoever that's here? that's interested to be part of you know, the whole ecosystem. So what's the, as you mentioned, as a platform? Because we can only provide a platform. <clears throat> but how can we you know, um, yeah, be, be such a strong base that differentiate us from China or from the States or even Israel? Or, uh, and I understand that in Europe, Sweden, you know, the, the Nordic countries, they're also very active. So somehow, I mean, the other aspect that one of the gentlemen brought up is funding, you know, and, and somehow, yes, the government do provide funding, spring and all, <clears throat> but I think sometimes funding, when funding is too easy, the, you know, the, the drive is, or the perseverance is not there. Yeah, so I, I'd like to hear your comment. Yeah. I think NUS society can, many of you here, would be great man because David Ho himself, a very successful businessman. He, you know, should be one of them. In fact, one of the time I spoke with a number of NUS society members, I said, you, some of you should already volunteer to be mentors with some of our classes, some of me. I think mentorship is really something that we need to promote because the young people who are entrepreneurs in startups and so forth need a lot of advice. They do need advice, and that's not enough of it. The other thing that, that I should mention is that it is a very tough road. You see, 
The thing about going to China or Silicon Valley, you see the young people work. You know, when you see the way they work, you say, wow, if I want to succeed, I better work as hard, if not harder than they are. So, you know, it's like, so that's good. So, I think you want to create that kind of uh, environment, that kind of ecosystem. Because if you go to Inoue in Beijing, or you go to the startup center in Shenzhen, you see those guys working around the clock, eating pizza, sleeping on their desks, and so forth. When you see that, say, wow, I also want to be like, I also want to succeed, and I'm going to try as hard. So I think part of this is they get, you know, look at each other and say, I got to compete. I don't know enough the system here, but I think you're right. If you're too well funded, then there isn't the hunger, that drive. I think drive is very important. And sometimes the drive comes because the opportunities are few. The only way forward is to be an entrepreneur. You know? And so sometimes, you know, the lack of opportunities, the lack of opportunities can be the best driver for entrepreneurship. You can say, I create my own company. You know? Well, there's no questions. I can only say, Prof, you have... Uh, sorry, Johnny, okay. Well, one last question before. I think taking a lot of your time now. <laughs> Yeah, Prof. Shi, just a quick one. I like the idea of um, your proposal to uh, establish a, 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 a launch pack, innovation launch pack. Um, the, it's a great idea, but how do you uh, foresee that being carried out? Are you suggesting that the government, you know, uh, fund it, or you? I mean, it's a great idea, mega trend and all that, and you should ride on it. But I, I can't. Given what I know today. You know, and, and reading what the, the government is trying to do with their new economic committee, with the five subcommittee, you know, and that's why, like Kim Singh pointed out before the, the dialogue, uh, there's nothing on seeding innovation DNA, right, so to speak. So, how do you emphasize your, your launch pack being, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, implemented given the current Singapore context. Thank you. Yeah, you know, that's what I'm saying. The launch pad is simply a vehicle to really propagate the, de the innovation DNA. It really ultimately is about the DNA. Because you can put a lot in education, in, in infrastructure and so forth. It's the entrepreneur that takes it it forward. I think this is going to be a, a challenging problem because this uh, innovation DNA, I mean you look at Israel, very successful. They only have a fraction of the funding we have. And you can see the number of startups they create. Right? The Nordic countries, the, the, the Sweden and so forth, even China with the overall economic level much lower than us. I see the innovation DNA. I see it propagating. I think the government can do something because Singapore, as I understand, I don't have the figures. We have what? Several hundred billion, I don't know, in, in terms of um, in our reserves. So what do we take? It's investing in the future. As Dr. Tan said, the present country, we got to make sure that Singapore is a great place for our sons and daughters and for our grandchildren. This innovation DNA is the future. This ecosystem is the future. And so maybe we have to take a fraction of that and put it into creating these innovation launch pads all over the world. Because really, if you think of five million people, you're taking with I said, what's the upside to create a new technology or innovation just for 5 million people? You really got to think worldwide. And if you want to think worldwide, you better go to China, Silicon Valley, uh, Sweden, or UK to find out what it, the markets are like, who you need to talk to, who are your peers, who are the ones you're competing with. How else are you going to succeed, you see? Because if you look at 5 million, what is incentive to to create a company for 5 million people.
Think of all that you have to go through. So you have to think global. So this launch pad is really to create that global mind, that global you know, network. At the same time, you've got to create the DNA, the innovation DNA. That is very tough. So it's a mix of all these things. Now I think the government can do that. Look, I think the EDB, EDB has a budget of what? I don't have the money, billions, right? Big money, yes. To bring in MNCs. I think we can make a much smaller investment and say, okay, we want to give our young entrepreneurs a taste of what is it to compete in the startup hotspots worldwide, what it takes to be an entrepreneur, a learning curve for them. And if you send in, in total, a couple of thousand a year, it's a small number compared to, as I mentioned, there must be 100,000, 200,000 students in tertiary education in Singapore. So all you're saying is maybe partially fund 1,000, 2,000 students, you know, a steady state to different parts of the world. I think this is a good investment, of course. I don't have to pay up for the money, so I think it's a good investment. <laughs> but I think it works. So I hope that in part answer your question. Yes, Mr. Lai, yes. One last question. Eh? Just one last question, Prof. I'm going to add on to what Johnny has said just now. Perhaps somebody with the right connection could maybe just whisper in the ears of the finance minister, perhaps to create a sixth committee just to include those two suggestions that you made. Because I think it's, it is a very serious uh, suggestion, and uh, based on what you've just shared with us, uh, perhaps somebody should really take this to the government and say, these are good ideas. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think really sometimes we got to think big. And really, I can tell you, this are the mega trends. I see China responding. China is going with mass entrepreneurship, grassroots innovation. And of course, the state enterprises are a little concerned. They are concerned. <laughs> so, but they see it. So I think besides doing all the things we do, sometimes we have to speak to our people, our society, the mega trends, which are both threats and opportunity. And we can relate the story of Sun Chun in 30 years what happened. We can relate the story of Detroit, what happened. And Hong Kong is not doing that well compared to Sun Chun. So there are many things that are happening, and I think perhaps a U.S. society should, you know, write to the Minister of Finance. We should consider what are big mega trends. They are both threats and opportunity. And if we do not factor mega trends correctly in our strategic planning as we go forward, I think that might be a heavy price to pay in the years ahead. Well, Prof, I hope when we see you maybe another 10 years from now to review this, uh, NUS with all the talents will have a dropout and be a very mega, mega, uh, what I call entrepreneur. Because I think that's one benchmark. We can decide whether we are reaching that target or not. Thank you very much. I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. David Ho and Professor Shi Chun Fong for the engaging Q&A session. Uh, we would now like to present a token of appreciation to Professor Shi Chun Fong. Mr. Ho, please. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We also like to invite Mr. Jeffrey Ku on stage for a photo shot. So uh, thank you all for attending today's talk and we look forward to seeing you at our next dialogue. Coffee and tea are still available at the main lobby. Thank you and good night.